Biles reports managers at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter are counting their blessings. The second terrorist attack was a direct hit on the office space of Morgan Stanley. The firm had 3,500 workers in 22 floors, almost exactly in the area where the second plane hit. But incredibly, most of those employees had already fled the tower minutes before the explosion. Miraculously, I'd say, uh, we had 2,500 people in World Trade Center 2, 1,000 uh, people in World Trade Center 5, um, it appears the vast majority uh, got out safely. A miracle made possible by the firm's split-second decision to evacuate the South Tower immediately after the North Tower was hit. We have a lot of stories of uh, courage, uh, a lot of stories of uh, compassion, and uh, we're going to be we're going to be fine. Wall Street is a tough business where it's often said the only thing that matters is the bottom line. That is not true today. The thing that matters most to these companies is finding out exactly how many of their employees are alive today. Peter Vile, CNN Financial News, New York. As well as the appalling human cost, there are many more implications, including the impact on the global economy. Richard Quest joins us now from London with an update on business. Richard. Uh, many thanks indeed, Jonathan. Yes, the European Central Bank uh, is meeting in Frankfurt around now to discuss how best to limit the economic impact of the attack that was seen in New York. Many people believe that the ECB will make some sort of gesture and perhaps reduce European interest rates. The idea, once again, to try and rebuild confidence, to provide liquidity not only uh, to the markets but also to consumers who may, of course, uh, have been frightened off by what they saw. It seems to be a split view on whether the ECB will actually cut rates. They did so last month. And the last word from the ECB president was that that probably wasn't necessary. We'll have that decision for you in around three hours' time. To the markets that have been trading in the Asian trading day, also on currency rates, the Japanese yen trading at 119 to the US dollar, the euro at 90 US cents, the pound at 146.52. What we've seen there is some dollar strength coming back into the markets. In Asia, when trading was finished for the session, Japan's Nikkei average actually was up a touch at the close of the day. In Hong Kong, the Hang Seng was also up, in that case, up by up more than 1%, although Hong Kong had suffered quite sharply lower in the previous day, and Singapore was down 1%. On the European markets, because business is well and truly underway, the London FTSE up around half a percent, the DAX three quarters of a percent in Frankfurt, waiting for the ECB decision, while the CAC in Paris is basically flat. That's the way the financial world outside the United States is looking at the moment. Maggie Lake now joins us to bring us up to date with what's happening in New York. Maggie? Richard, we're getting ever closer to morning here, and as the bond market is reopening. We wait for stocks perhaps Friday, Monday at the latest to open. There are a few major questions facing the markets. Uh, the first is, will this event push the U.S. economy into recession? We have been limping along. Perhaps this is the straw. Some people saying that breaks the camel's back and pushes us into negative territory. Another big question, will it crack consumer confidence, cause people to spend, pull back on spending and start selling stocks, especially near term? And finally, what can the Federal Reserve do? They are providing liquidity. Will they also cut interest rates immediately, as some have suggested and recommended that they do? Now, these are enormous questions. And uh, just want to offer a couple of thoughts on some sentiment coming out from analysts and market watchers today. Uh, first of all, in terms of the threat of recession, obviously the business disruption is going to be massive. And no one is pretending it is not going to hurt profits of many companies. But analysts are saying once we get back that, Diane Swank, one speaking today, saying although it's a disaster and great tragedy, Ironically, after the initial, initial disruption, uh, the economy often sees a spurt in economic activity. We are a country that rebuilds, and we will. We've already seen the government talking about a package of up, maybe up to $20 billion. Spending on defense is expected, security. So there will be some stimulus there. Also, in terms of the consumer, uh, 
We may see some initial selling, some initial uh, panic or jitters, but a lot of people are offering the suggestion that perhaps people will rally around and actually buy stocks uh, in a show of support for the country. Get, uh, people's sort of spirits galvanized. We're hearing a lot of that sentiment come out from people on the street, a lot of patriotic feeling. It is a possibility. It's a very emotional time. It's not clear that that will happen, but we certainly are hearing a lot about that possibility, and not just from individual investors, even from the institutional side. There was a bond trader from PIMCO talking today, and he was asked if they will be selling into the market tomorrow, and his response was that we will trade, but we are not going to aggressively try and exploit this situation. We are bond traders, but we are first and foremost citizens. So there are an awful lot of questions. It is not clear by any means what the outcome is. People should not assume it will all be negative, and a lot of uh, officials and uh, advisors are cautioning people to be patient and calm as we work through some of these questions. Jonathan, back to you. Maggie Lake, thanks very much. A different bit of business now, a word to our viewers. Ordinarily, you'd be seeing CNN Newsroom, our daily educational program for the classroom at this time. CNN Newsroom will not be seen today or tomorrow, but will return on Monday with a special program focusing on the attacks on the U.S. We'll look at the events of this week, look at the history of terrorism, and talk with young people about how they've been affected. In the meantime, teachers can find educational materials relating to the attacks, focusing on how to talk with young people about the situation on our educational website. That's CNNFYI.com. There has been quick action on Capitol Hill should the U.S. ever find those responsible for Tuesday's atrocities. House lawmakers followed the Senate's lead in passing a resolution vowing retaliation. Kelly Wallace is in Washington. She joins us now with more on what's going on in the nation's capital. Kelly. Well, Relita, a big focus for the Bush administration is laying the groundwork for a possible military response, working with Congress and also using diplomatic channels. First, as you mentioned to Congress, the White House asking lawmakers to pass a resolution authorizing the use of force to retaliate for the four deadly terrorist attacks. There you see a live picture of the U.S. Capitol at this time. Now, we do know from senior officials that the White House and lawmakers have been negotiating negotiating over the wording of such a use of force resolution, some comparing it to the resolution passed by Congress back in 1991, giving President Bush's father the authority to use force after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Some other congressional leaders expressing some concern that such a resolution could, in essence, give Mr. Bush a blank check to use military action. Now, on another front, not as controversial, Congress expected to get a bill to the president's desk, possibly as early as this day, authorizing $20 billion in emergency aid to help with search and rescue efforts, as well as to help with the rebuilding in these communities that have been affected by these attacks, and of course, to aid federal, state, and local agencies. Relitza, of course, the feelings here still tremendous sadness, flags throughout the nation's capital at half staff, and we saw a prayer vigil last night. It began at the U.S. Capitol. There were people holding candles, carrying American flags, and some people singing, we understand, God bless America, walking from the U.S. Capitol and then proceeding to Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House. Now, on the diplomatic front, President Bush has been reaching out to world leaders to build what the White House is calling an international coalition against terrorism. Mr. Bush on Wednesday talking to the leaders of Canada, Britain, France, Germany, China, and Russia also released to so the administration quite gratified by NATO statement which said that an attack on one member of the alliance is the same as an attack on the alliance. Now on Wednesday, Mr. Bush had two separate meetings with his national security team, more meetings with his key advisors likely on this day. Again, U.S. officials publicly not commenting about who they think is responsible for these attacks, but privately senior officials saying that the evidence is certainly looking and pointing to affiliates of Accused terrorist Osama bin Laden. Relitza? Kelly, thank you. The Tuesday's devastating attacks came against the wealthiest, best defended country in the world, only added to the shock and amazement. Though the United States blazes its own trail in international diplomacy, Washington is now courting support for any possible response against the perpetrators. Andrea Koppel reports. 
With much of the nation focused on the tragedy at home, Secretary of State Colin Powell set his sights overseas, taking the helm in U.S. diplomatic efforts to build international support against terrorism. We're building a strong coalition to go after these perpetrators, but more broadly, to go after terrorism wherever we find it in the world. It's a scourge not only against the United States, but against civilization, and it must be brought to an end. Ten years ago, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Gulf War, then General Powell helped build the coalition against Iraq. But this time, the victim is the United States, and the enemy still unknown. Nevertheless, Powell has already begun to lay the groundwork for an eventual military retaliation in phone calls with leaders in Israel, the Palestinian territories, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. Powell also reached out to the European Union, as well as the Arab League, United Nations, and the NATO Military Alliance, which for the first time in its history Wednesday, invoked a clause in the NATO Charter obligating all members to assist if one is attacked. It's like dropping a stone in the middle of a pond and you have ripples rippling out. And we start with ourselves, then we go to our closest allies in Europe through NATO, and we show the world that this time there are none of the usual divisions between us and the Europeans in regard to this region. Secretary Powell also sent stern warnings to Pakistan, a neighbor and supporter of Afghanistan's Taliban militia, accused of harboring suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden. The message? The U.S. expects complete cooperation in finding those responsible for Tuesday's attacks. Next week, Powell plans to send his deputy to Moscow for a special meeting with Russian officials on Afghanistan. Secretary Powell working every possible diplomatic angle, telling the international community, in the words of one aide, you're either with us or against us. Andrea Koppel, CNN, at the State Department. Many British citizens are believed to be among the victims of the New York attacks. Prime Minister Tony Blair immediately condemned them, offering help to find those responsible. But what kind of role might Britain and the rest of Europe take in the search for suspects? Joining us live from London is CNN's European political editor, Robin Oakley. Robin? Jonathan, I've just uh, been talking to Jack Straw, the British Foreign Secretary uh, at the Foreign Office, and uh, the first response from him was that the British public, uh, certainly, and many people across Europe, have taken this attack on the United States as if it was an attack on them. He was saying that many British citizens work in the United States, many U.S. citizens work in Britain and in Europe. There is a real sense of solidarity about this. But when I said to him, look, you and Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, are talking about standing shoulder to shoulder with the United States, what does that really mean? Does it merely mean moral support? He said, no, it clearly means military support. NATO is not just about an expression of moral support. NATO is about providing tangible military support. That is the point. That is what Article 5 is about. If you're asking me to speculate, on the nature of that military or intelligence support, I can't, but uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell gave some indication of the kind of support for which the United States might be looking to if they decide on particular military actions. There are, of course, some worries in Europe about what kind of level of response America might choose to make uh, once the target, once the perpetrators are identified and once it has a target to strike back at. Uh, Mr. Straw said to me that that is a question that will be discussed uh, between America and America's NATO allies, the, the level of support. And the intelligence communities, he said, of the UK and the US are in constant touch with each other. But when I said there were some worries in Europe that perhaps too big a response from the United States at this time might lead to a perpetuation of terrorism, that maybe the right response was not necessarily an eye for an eye. Uh, Mr. Straw said, no, there were dangers uh, in the alternative response to that, and you simply could not make it a case, uh, you had to, uh, it could not be a case of turning the other cheek, as it were. I'm sitting in the British Foreign Office. It's not more than 50 yards away from 10 Downing Street. I remember the day in the early 90s when the provisional IRA mortared Downing Street and tried to take out the cabinet. I remember 1984 when they bombed 
the hotel in Brighton in Sussex and almost killed Margaret Thatcher, the then democratic elected prime minister. And it wasn't about retribution, but in each case, the attack on the terrorists, the need to take very firm action against those terrorists, as well as political action to undermine their support, was very necessary. And unless there had been action taken of a firm kind against those terrorists, I have to say there would never have been a peace process in Northern Ireland. So that's a very clear message, Jonathan, coming certainly from the UK, and we're likely to hear much the same from the rest of NATO. Uh, they have invoked Article 5. This action, this terrorist action against the United States, has been taken as an attack against all members of NATO, and the response will be an appropriate one. Jonathan. Is there any sign of military preparation in the United Kingdom? People are clearly using words like war and uh, retribution. Uh, are they getting ready for something there? Uh, difficult to assess that at the moment, Jonathan, because Jack Straw and other ministers, when you start pressing for military or intelligence detail, immediately clam up. But they certainly admit to a high state of military preparedness. I'm quite certain that preparations are going on, but I think the expectation is not of absolutely immediate action. Jonathan. Robin Oakley, thanks very much. As Americans grieve some images from other parts of the world, surprise, even shock. Palestinians celebrating the terrorist attacks, other Arabs scolding U.S. policies. Seen as Cairo bureau chief, Ben Wiedemann explains where some of the anti-U.S. anger comes from. A group of Palestinians celebrate at the news of the attacks in New York and Washington. Other Palestinians, including those who held a vigil outside the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem, say such sentiments do not represent the majority. But few in the region deny they share a growing sense of anger and frustration with U.S. policy in the Middle East, where, over the years, the U.S. has managed to gain the bitter enmity of millions. For decades, Arabs have been critical of America's substantial diplomatic, economic, and military support for Israel, while many believe the U.S. has turned a blind eye to Palestinian demands that Israel leave Arab land. You know, the anti-American feeling gets very high now in the Middle East and the Muslim world because what's happening on uh, the occupied territories, and many people accuse the United States of actually helping the Israeli and protecting them. Since the outbreak of the Palestinian uprising nearly a year ago, anger at the United States has increased dramatically. Alarmed at growing anti-American sentiment, traditional U.S. allies in the region, including Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, have warned that American interests are at risk if the U.S. doesn't modify its Mideast policy. Another source of bitterness, Iraq. For more than a decade, Washington has insisted upon maintaining harsh United Nations economic sanctions, officially intended to target the regime of Iraqi President Saddam Hussein. Yet many blame the sanctions for causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of ordinary Iraqis from disease and malnutrition. Elsewhere, Washington has been the most vocal advocate of economic and political sanctions against Libya, Sudan, Iran, and Afghanistan, all predominantly Muslim countries. The day the Muslim countries unite, says this Pakistani, Russia and the U.S. will flow away like a gust of water. You can't blame Palestine or anyone else. It's a natural destruction. You've asked for it. Responsibility for Tuesday's massive terror attack has yet to be determined, but few in the Mideast doubt the depth of anger and hatred toward the United States. Ben Wiedemann, CNN. A moment ago, we heard from Britain. All 15 countries, though, of the European Union have pledged their support for the United States at an emergency meeting in Brussels. And in a separate meeting, NATO has declared the hijack attacks an assault against all NATO member states. Diana Muriel joins us now from Brussels with the latest there. Diana? 
Yes, Jonathan, here in Brussels today, NATO, NATO will continue their meetings today. No press conferences are planned, but Lord Robertson, the Secretary General of NATO, is still in Brussels, and we hope to be speaking to him on CNN later in the day. Interestingly, last night, the reason why the decision from NATO came so late on the ratification of Article 5 of the Treaty of Washington, where all member states agreed that an attack on one member was an attack on them all. The reason it was so late was because the uh, Br Belgian Parliament held uh, a d debate here in Brussels they hold the presidency of the European Union and there were some concerns and some, some objections raised by some of the Belgian political parties, particularly the Green parties and the Socialists, about the wording of the communique that NATO was going to issue. The particular problem was over the use of the phrase act of war to describe the attacks in Washington and New York. They have modified the language, and in fact, if you read the communique carefully, you will see at the end they describe it as an act of barbarism. And this was a compromise uh, that was made yesterday here in Brussels. The parliament demanded the suspension of the NATO ambassadors meeting until they could agree the wording, and that is why George, uh, Lord Robertson spoke so late last night uh, to uh, ratify the Article 5 of the Treaty of Washington. Jonathan. Article 5 has never been invoked before, and so this is something for historians to be watching. But in practical terms, is it clear what NATO is being asked to do now, what it is prepared to do? No, it is not absolutely clear, Jonathan. What will happen is, as uh, Robin Oakley was explaining, and indeed as Jack Straw was explaining in that interview that you saw just a moment ago, uh, they need to identify the target specifically. Once that is done, then each individual NATO member will make a decision as to what level of participation they will provide to the effort. There are, of course, some hawks, Britain amongst them, and Germany also considered a hawk, and some doves, particularly Belgium and France. Belgium, of course, in the Gulf War did not send soldiers. They sent military experts who are experts in mines. Uh, they sent F-16 fighters. But Belgium is not expected, one of the countries not expected, to send soldiers should this develop into some sort of military operation. Jonathan. Diana Muriel in Brussels. Thanks very much. All this because of what has happened in the United States and in New York at its most destructive, where the skyline is ravaged, people find neighbors and loved ones now dead. Grief, anger, and a strong sense of solidarity are replacing the first shock. We return to Garrick Utley in New York, where people of a battered city are coming to grips with the horror of Tuesday's attack. Garrick? Coming to grips, Jonathan, of course, but also the key question that we're hearing every day right now is when is life going to return to normal in New York City? Silly question. When was life ever normal in this, uh, in this metropolis here with more than 7 million people? On uh, Wednesday, there were some signs of some kind of normalcy uh, returning, and on Thursday, there'll be even more uh, milestones along that path. But we want to take a moment now and get a rather impressionistic look of how New Yorkers have been coping, how they've been coming back. These are people who are not at ground zero down there in lower Manhattan, but all over uh, Manhattan today. Producer Bonnie Bertram and camera operator Dave Timko offer their view. September 12, 2001, New York, the day after the World Trade Center was attacked and collapsed. People are sticking closely to their cell phones, trying to get any news they can of what's happening. He doesn't have any identification on him, and we certainly hope someone recognizes him for at least like this all day long. Still waiting to find out how many people are being rescued and what the situation is downtown. Somebody please send me. Hi, Nick. Can I help you? Very fast. Nick. Where are you visiting from? Just from Spain. From Spain? We are so, so terrified and we don't know if we can get home again and see our families. Are you going to JFK today? Oh, he won't take you? No, he's he can't go. Yeah, I'm trying to. They think if they go out, they won't be able to get back into the cities. But I'm, I'm like Dorothy, the Wizard of Oz. I just want to get home. If I could click my heels and make it happen, I would do it. Is this your limo? Huh? I do. Yes, it is. Did you guys, are you taking it to the airport or somewhere? Take no, it we're Texas. taking it to Texas. All the way to Texas? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not flying, I think. No. no. All the way to Texas. It's going to take 30, 32, 32 hours. hours. Who knows when to. they're going to open the airports again, and we could be here till Saturday or so, so we made the decision to go. Even though they have their lights on, I'm pretty sure there's not going to be a performance tonight. Tonight there is no show. A matinee today? No matinee today. Our next show is tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Just contact Telecharge. I believe your accounts have already been credited. When did you buy your tickets? Four months ago, maybe. My phone's ringing. 
it'll, it'll, come, it'll come to London. Right, so you. you might get a chance to see it again. Eventually. So Times Square, it seems pretty quiet today. It's usually much more packed than this. Theater matinees have been canceled. It's basically pretty calm. It just like it seems like everybody's walking around and dazing, just thinking about it. Did you feel scared a little bit yesterday? Mm, not really. I felt it was, and I ran home and watched the news, and it was kind of scary about all those buildings falling. You just feel this air in the city. It's different. People are more somber. I think more contemplative. So we're in Central Park, and we're at a place called Strawberry Fields, and there's a memorial here for John Lennon. And it always seems like in times of pain, New Yorkers tend to congregate here. I knew someone who worked there, so it's been difficult. He's missing. We don't know. <laughs> you haven't heard anything no. yet? No, no, but I don't have a good feeling about it. <laughs> so, just sad. Well, imagine what's coming up now. To answer some of the questions there, if returning to normal in New York City means that Times Square will be filled and the theaters will be open, they will be uh, filled and open on Thursday evening, uh, not far from here, up in Times Square. If return to normal life means schools being open, filled with students, yes, they will be open tomorrow. If normalcy in New York City means being able to ride the subway system, this vast mass transportation system, Yes, the subways will be running tomorrow, all the lines except one, which is, a minor detail, the sea line. Jonathan, guess who rides the sea line? Back to you. Garrett Gutley, thanks very much. NATO has declared the attacks to be an assault against all its 18 members. As we reported, for the first time in more than five decades, the alliance has invoked Article 5 of the NATO Charter, which says if one member of state is under attack, all others will defend it. For more on what that might involve, we are joined now by Pio Cabanillas, chief government spokesman for a key NATO ally, Spain. Mr. Cabanillas, thank you very much for joining us. What did it take for Spain to take this, this decision? You're very welcome. Let me state our position very clearly. We are on your side. We are on your side because you're friends, because you're allies, because we share the same values because we believe in democracy, because we believe in human rights, because we are sure that terrorism is the greatest threat to democracy and to the international community, and because we suffer terrorism ourselves. We know what you're going through. We go through that too. Again, we are on your side. Uh, Mr. Cabanillas, there are two military bases in Spain that were uh, used during the Gulf War. Uh, will uh, you allow the United States to make use of them should there be a decision made for retaliation? Well, you know that there is a procedure to be completed. First, for the application of Article 5, it has to be demonstrated. That's what the declaration said yesterday. It has to be demonstrated that there is an attack, an armed attack coming from abroad. And then each country has the right to determine in which way they contribute to the common cause. Of course, talking and in close contact to all other allies and of course in close contact to the United States. So the Spanish contribution w would be determined in due course. What I want to make very clear from now is that we are very much in favor of uh, what is being discussed right now. When uh, President Bush visited uh, earlier this year, he visited during his European trip, he actually started his European trip in Spain. Uh, did he and uh, Prime Minister Aznar talk about Basque terrorism? I think that first and the most important thing they did is to recognize that terrorism was an international problem and that the only way to defend ourselves against that is international unity. He was very generous to the Spaniards, and we appreciate that very much. He stood side by side with us. Today, we stand side by side with you. They did talk, they have been talking, and I'm sure that we will both contribute to uh, the fight we are all into. Mr. Cabanillas, thank you very much. And here we pass the baton to our colleagues, Carol Lynn and Vince Cellini. I'm Elisa Vasilova. And I'm Jonathan Mann. We leave you with the scene outside the White House Wednesday night.